My Lord Mayor, Lady Mayoress, distinguished guests, welcome to the 26th annual Pilgrim Fathers Lecture. This highly anticipated and celebrated event commemorates the voyage of the Pilgrim Fathers to America in 1620. It is organized by the Plymouth Law Society and hosted by the University of Plymouth and Plymouth City Council. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the University of Plymouth and Plymouth City Council for their invaluable support and assistance, both organizations being central to ensuring the continuing success of this event. I would also like to thank Stephen Hudson, the Law Society Council member for the West Country and Gwent, Plymouth and Cornwall, for all Stephen's hard work. Throughout the year, Stephen spends many hours fine-tuning the arrangements, and this attention to detail plays a major part in ensuring the enduring success of what is one of the most prestigious events in the West Country legal calendar. Over the years, the Pilgrim Fathers Lecture has been delivered by some very distinguished and inspirational speakers, and this year is no exception. The lecture this year will be given by the Right Honourable, the Lord Burnett of Malden. Lord Burnett studied law at Pembroke College, Oxford, and was called to the bar in 1980. He became a pupil and then a member of Temple Garden Chambers, where he practiced until May 2008 for the last five years as head of chambers. Lord Burnett's practice was in common law and public law. In the early years, he undertook a range of common law work, including personal injury, professional negligence, landlord and tenant, crime, and family law. He then focused on public and administrative law, personal injury, and health and safety law, including acting as junior counsel to the King's Cross Fire Inquiry, and to the inquiry into the convictions of the Guildford Four and Maguire family. He was leading counsel to the inquiry into the Southall rail crash and the train protection systems following the Paddington train crash. His final case at the bar was as counsel to the inquests into the deaths of Diana, Princess of Wales, and Dodi Al Fayed. Lord Burnett was junior counsel for the Crown Common Law from 1992 and was appointed as Queen's Counsel in 1998. Appointed as a recorder in 2000, he sat as a part-time judge in the Crown Court. On appointment to the High Court in 2008, Lord Burnett joined the Queen's Bench Division. He was presiding judge of the Western Circuit from 2011 until 2014, when he was appointed to the Court of Appeal. Lord Burnett was Vice Chairman of the Independent Judicial Appointments Commission from November 2015 until March 2017. He was appointed Lord Chief Justice in October 2017, the youngest holder of that office for 50 years. More recently, in the High Court, Lord Burnett heard the legal challenge brought by businesswoman Jim Miller following on from the Prime Minister's decision to prorogue Parliament. And although he ruled that the Prime Minister did not act unlawfully by proroguing Parliament, Gina Miller was given leave to appeal because there were important points of law at stake. Outside of work, Lord Burnett spends time with his family. And um, I'm also reliably informed that he has a keen interest in collecting silverware and in fine wines. Lord Burnett is particularly interested in history, mainly British, European and classical. It helps him to understand the problems of today and the influences of the past. As Winston Churchill once said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I understand that um, Father Christmas has made the long journey from the North Pole to switch on the Plymouth Christmas lights this evening. But that's nothing, nothing compared with Lord Burnett's day, which started with an important event at Buckingham Palace this morning and has been followed by the most tortuous of journeys 
in order for him to be here with us on time and for which we shall be forever grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, Lord Bernard. many happy weeks as a high court judge when presiding judge on the Western Circuit. When the Pilgrim Fathers set off on their great journey across the Atlantic, the subject of my talk, the High Court of England and Wales, did not yet exist. More accurately, it didn't exist in its current form. As we shall see, the High Court of England and Wales and its three divisions, the Queen's Bench, the Family and Chancery Divisions, like so much of our constitutional architecture, <coughs> is the product of a long and continuous evolution, jockeying for position and political horse trading. The names are familiar, but save for the Family Division, created in 1970, they give no real hint of the work done within the jurisdictions. The High Court's ultimate origin lies, as so, uh, with so much else, in the events of 1066 and the establishment of settled changes in the governance of England in the years that followed. Conquest saw the replacement of Saxon justice with Norman justice, dispensed by the Curia Regis, the King's Court. Court then meant more than it does today. It was as much an advisory body as it was a judicial one. Because of its dual role, it was composed not only of what were known as the king's justiciars, who were learned in the law, the predecessors of the justices of the high court, but also the great officers of state, many of whose offices continue in one way or another today. As might be expected for feudal times, Justice was not just dispensed in the king's name by the Curia Regis, but the king himself. That the sovereign remains the fountain of justice is evidenced daily in our courts. It is symbolized by the royal court of coat of arms in our courtrooms. And as Lord Devlin explained in giving judgment in the case of Riquet in the House of Lords in 1965, all justice flows from the prerogative, that is to say, the royal prerogative. In today's lecture, I want to trace the development of the courts, the creation of the High Court and its divisions, and consider more recent reforms. The early Middle Ages were, as we all know, a rather energetic time for monarchs. Most spent significant amounts of time fighting wars, visiting their overseas dominions or engaged in attempts to stamp out civil war or maintain control at home. It was unsurprising then that over time the Curia began to hear and determine disputes without the king being present. Justice was done by the Curia in the king's name rather than by the king himself. That was not simply for reasons of convenience but also due to the principle emerging that justice should be dispensed by individuals who were learned in the law, the judiciary. That the monarch could not dispense justice personally was put beyond doubt during the reign of James I. In the case of prohibitions in 1607, one of the courts that evolved out of the Curia Regis overturned an attempt by James to decide a property dispute. Property disputes between subjects were dealt with by the Court of Common Pleas. The King had wished to determine a case himself. Uh, he said, in cases where there is no express authority in law, the King may himself decide in his royal person the judges are but delegates of the King. 
The king considered that there was no need to know any law to dispense justice. He was endowed by God with all the qualities that were needed and could apply his personal sense of justice. Sir Edward Cook, one of the most influential judges in our history, was then Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas. He disagreed, saying, the king in his own person cannot adjudge any case, either criminal, as treason, felony, etc., or betwixt party and party, but this ought to be determined and adjudged in some court of justice, according to the law and custom of England. The king was not at all happy with this outcome. Sir Edward was moved to be Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench, the most senior of the judicial positions. It was thought he could do less harm there to the prerogatives of the king. But he went on to hold that the king was subject to the law and could not legislate by proclamation. He was dismissed from office, but went back to the House of Commons <coughs> where he had sat and earlier been Attorney General long before he became a judge. He remained a thorn in the side of the Stuarts. <coughs> Which were the courts then that dispensed justice by the time Sir Edward Cook was clarifying one aspect of what today we would call the separation of powers? Over the course of the 11th to the 14th centuries, the curious judicial functions had gradually evolved into four courts. The superior courts of common law, and equity. Three were on the common law side. First, the Court of Common Pleas, which generally dealt with disputes between the King's subjects. Secondly, the Court of Exchequer of Pleas, <coughs> which until the 1870s, the Chancellor of the Exchequer remained a judge. It dealt originally with revenue matters. Its primary jurisdiction was between the King and subjects. Although through the use of legal fictions, it developed jurisdiction to hear personal actions between private individuals. The legal fiction employed was for the plaintiff to claim that he was either a farmer or a debtor of the crown. Finally, the court of King's Bench. It was originally an itinerant court following the king wherever he went. Its main function was to adjudicate on matters in which the Crown had an interest. It exercised both a criminal jurisdiction and also a supervisory jurisdiction, the foundation for today's judicial review jurisdiction. On what was known as the plea side, it had jurisdiction to deal with various types of dispute between private individuals, such as trespass to the person. The final court was the Superior Court of Equity, the High Court of Chancery. Originally, it too was a common law court with a jurisdiction that focused on the power to issue writs that formed the basis of the common law court's jurisdiction. It was headed by the Lord Chancellor. The common law courts decided forms of action which were restricted and formalistic. Yet there were many legal disputes that could not be resolved within the forms of action required by the common law courts. From this developed the equitable jurisdiction of the High Court of Chancery, many of whose features still permeate our law. For example, the distinct concepts of legal and equitable interests and the subtlety of the law of trusts. Until the 17th century, Equitable relief depended on the personal approaches, some would say prejudices, of the Lord Chancellor of the day, who were often ecclesiastics rather than lawyers. From this came the famous aphorism of the jurist John Selden, that equity was a roguish thing which depended on the length of the Lord Chancellor's foot. Thereafter, it developed its own rules, and the law of equity became a distinct but parallel code alongside the common law. In addition to the common law and equity courts, there was a further judicial strand, <coughs> that of the civilian courts, 
civilian because they exercised a civil law jurisdiction rather than the common law or equity. There were two main civilian courts, the High Court of Admiralty and the Ecclesiastical Courts, which amongst other things had jurisdiction over matters of probate as well as defamation. The organic development of these three distinct jurisdictions, common law, equity, and civilian law, with six or more major courts, had a number of inevitable but undesirable consequences. The first was competition, as each sought to expand their jurisdictions to increase their workload and fee income, in which the judges had a direct interest until their salaries were fixed. One consequence of this competition was the development of technical complexity in the law. Moreover, the Court of King's Bench increasingly developed legal fictions to expand its jurisdiction in what ought otherwise to have been the province of the Court of Common Pleas. It would take far too long to set out the twists and turns of the struggle for supremacy of this great competition in the delivery of justice, but its consequences did not well serve the administration of justice or the rule of law. By the 19th century, as is well known from literature at the time, such as Bleak House, justice was in a lamentable condition. There was a widespread realization that change was required. However, the legal establishment was then, and many would say now, instinctively resistant to change. The nonsense of having three competing common law courts all also in competition with the Court of Chancery, was the subject of a famous debate in the House of Commons in 1828, when Henry Broom delivered a damning indictment of the current position and articulated the need for reform. Two years later, he became Lord Chancellor in Lord Grey's reforming lib uh, liberal Whig administration and was a powerful proponent of electoral reform and the abolition of slavery, but he made little progress with the courts. The problems rumbled on, and in 1867, the Judicature Commission was appointed by Queen Victoria on the initiative of the Lord Chancellor, Lord Cairns, to examine the position and make recommendations for reform. In their first report of 1868, they said this, the distinction between common law and equity led to the establishment of two systems of justice organized in different ways and administering justice on different and sometimes opposite principles, using different methods of procedure and applying different remedies. The evils of the double system and the confusion and conflict of jurisdiction to which it has led have long been known and acknowledged. Those evils were primarily procedural complexity, excessive litigation cost, and inherent and exorbitant delay. Claims could be and were often brought in the wrong court. Procedural mistakes were rife. Any such errors would simply result in claims being struck out at the cost of the party in error. In some cases, due to the restrictions on jurisdiction, discrete aspects of the same claim had to be litigated before different courts. If, for instance, a party to a claim in a common law court needed to secure the compulsory disclosure of evidence from the opponent, an application to the Court of Chancery was necessary. Discovery or disclosure, <coughs> as it is now called, was a procedural device known only to that court due to its canon law inheritance. Organic, forgive me a second, uh, worse than this, uh, where the courts had competing overlapping jurisdiction, as was the case, for instance, in respect of company law disputes, the same dispute could be litigated before more than one court with contradictory judgments given by those different courts. In all of this, a litigant 
may equally have found it necessary to instruct multiple different classes of lawyer. Today, we have solicitors, barristers, and legal executives. Then, there were solicitors who acted in the equity courts, attorneys who acted in the common law courts, proctors for the ecclesiastical courts, and of course, barristers and sergeants at law as advocates. Organic evolution had produced a system, as Jeremy Bentham justifiably described it, that, one, that was one of exquisitely contrived chicanery, which maximizes delay and denial of justice. He was right. Almost nobody sought to justify the status quo. In principle, all nodded in favor of reform, but there were powerful vested interests at stake. The legal and political establishments spent the best part of 50 years, multiple reform reports and acts of parliament from the 1820s to the 1870s, trying to cure the problems caused by the multiplicity of courts and proliferation of jurisdictions. The answer the Judicature Commissioners finally came up with was the creation of a new, a single and unitary High Court of Justice as part of a new Supreme Court of Judicature. The other part of the Supreme Court of Judicature would be for the first time a general Court of Appeal. It is that structure which remains in place today. On any assessment, the Victorian reforms were radical. The Judicature Acts of 1873 and 1875 did not abolish the common law, equity, and civilian courts, but preferred to consolidate them in the new High Court, thus preserving and transferring their jurisdiction to it. There were five divisions, Queen's Bench, Common Pleas, Exchequer, <coughs> Chancery, and Probate, Divorce, and Admiralty, the last coming via the civilian legal tradition. Nonetheless, the change was substantial. For the first time in 900 years, there would be a single superior court with universal jurisdiction, its procedure operating according to a new, simple, and less technical civil procedure code, the rules of the Supreme Court, and a single judiciary. The judges of the previous courts became the judiciary of the new High Court and Court of Appeal. All applied the same way, <coughs> borrowing where necessary from the traditions of the predecessor courts. For the first time, the Lord Chancellor became the head of the judiciary. That was a radical change that caused the judiciary some discomfort, as it transferred the authority of the existing Chief Justices of the former common law courts to the government. The Lord Chancellor had previously been head only of the Court of Chancery. Sir Alexander Coburn, then Lord Chief Justice of the Court of Queen's Bench, and before that Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas, said that this aspect of the reform compromised the independence of the superior courts and gave dangerous power to the executive. How times and perspectives have changed. When the decision was taken some 130 years later to remove the Lord Chancellor as a judge and as head of the judiciary, transferring the role to the Lord Chief Justice, it was assumed by some that he had always been head of the judiciary as well as a cabinet minister speaking for the judiciary and government. Of course, much had changed in the intervening years. In the 1870s, the judicial heads of the common law courts, themselves almost always former politicians, had no difficulty in making the voice of the judiciary heard in government alongside the Lord Chancellor as head of the Court of Chancery, who was also a cabinet minister. The Lord Chancellor's role as the voice of the judiciary and guardian of the rule of law 
at the cabinet table evolved and assumed greater significance during the 20th century as the worlds of law and government became more remote from each other. The 1870s reforms may have been radical, but steps were taken to disguise the fact as far as possible. One of the ways this was done was through the creation of the High Court's divisions. What underpins the fears of Sir Alexander Coburn and the other common law judges was not just a government takeover of the courts. As a common law judge, he feared that the new High Court would be nothing more than, as he put it, the Court of Chancery under a new and high-sounding name to reign exclusively supreme. Ironically, the most active complaints by the legal profession at the time came from the Chancery Bar. Coburn saw in the reforms not just what he described as the triumph of equity, but the emasculation <coughs> of the common law and its traditions. In some ways, he was not altogether wrong in his fears. Aspects of the common law systems of justice were effectively replaced by those drawn from the Chancery Court. Three examples illustrate this point. First, common law courts historically would sit on bank. That means that all the judges would sit together to hear cases. <coughs> The numbers were then small, with each of the common law courts having four or five ordinary judges, together with their chief. In Chancery, the Lord Chancellor, the Master of the Rolls, or the Vice Chancellors sat alone. Secondly, at common law, the court's authority was divided between the judge and jury. In Chancery, there were no juries. Thirdly, at common law, the pleading process was highly technical and restricted by the forms of action, the aim being to reduce each dispute to a single issue. In Chancery, while the pleading process was technical, it was not limited by any forms of action, and rather than being aimed at reducing disputes to a single issue, it sought to decide all relevant matters arising within the dispute. On each of these, and other points, the approach in Chancery came substantially to be adopted. The survival of divisional courts to hear some cases in the Queen's Bench Division, when more than one judge sits to hear a case, when it's exercising its supervisory and criminal jurisdiction, might be seen as a vestigial remnant of the pre-1873 practice of the common law courts sitting on the bank. Stephen Subrin, an American procedural scholar, uh, put it when he considered equivalent uh, reforms in the United States that equity conquered the common law. The creation of the High Court divisions was one way to ameliorate the judges and lawyers' concerns. The new Supreme Court of Judicature was to be a shell divided into permanent courts, the High Court and the Court of Appeal, the latter at the time only to have civil jurisdiction. The Court of Criminal Appeal was not created until 1908, and it was, its jurisdiction was not transferred to the Court of Appeal until 1966, when the structure we have today of two divisions of the Court of Appeal was established. The High Court was divided into the separate divisions I've identified. Each division was to be given specific jurisdiction to deal with particular types of dispute. The naming of the divisions was the matter of acute debate. The original suggestion was that they should be called the first division, second division, third division, and so on. The aim was to ensure that the old courts did not simply come back in a new form even if the work of the divisions was to correspond to that of the old courts, but save for the Admiralty and Ecclesiastical Courts jurisdiction, which would be wrapped up in one. 
that was a step too far for many. When the reforms had first been introduced in a bill by the Liberal Lord Chancellor, Lord Hatherley, he had neglected to do the groundwork of getting influential support on board and put almost everybody's nose out of joint. He didn't even square his proposals in advance with Lord Cairns, who had chaired the commission and was Conservative leader in the House of Lords. The bill left much to rules and delegated legislation, which many lawyers found offensive. It faltered. A revised bill was introduced by his successor, Lord Selwyn, who was more adept at securing the necessary support. His bill, which became the 1873 Act, provided <coughs> detail and calmed nerves by retaining the old names. The serving Chief Justices of the various courts were also to become the heads of the new divisions. A final subtlety was introduced to assuage the fears of the common law judges. When the amendments to the Judicature Bill were made to introduce the new divisions, top of the list was the Queen's Bench Division, not the Chancery Division. Chief Justice of the Queen's Bench became the first Lord Chief Justice of England. Ever since then, the order of precedence has seen the Queen's Bench take the top spot. The Court of Queen's Bench had long been the senior of the common law courts. This was reflected in two tangible ways. First, its Chief Justice was paid an astonishingly large salary. Then, I should emphasize, not that. <laughs> and second, by convention, he was given a peerage. Uh, that, however, was denied to Sir Alexander Coburn by Queen Victoria. She noted that, and I quote, this peerage has been more than once previously refused on the ground of the notoriously bad moral character of the Chief Justice. His offense was to have lived with a woman to whom he was not married and had children. The new High Court was thus made to look as similar to its predecessors as possible, even if the substance of its jurisdiction was drawn from all of them. That said, this similarity was intended to be no more than temporary. It was made clear that the divisions were not to be permanent, and that as the business of the courts changed in the future, reorganization would take place. Sir George Jessel, QCMP, at the time Solicitor General and later Master of the Rolls, was responsible for the Act's passage through the House of Commons. He set out the position when explaining why there was to be no office of Vice-Chancellor created. I quote, The Chancery Division was not meant to be permanent, but was merely transitional and it was hoped in a short period, perhaps about 10 years, to obtain this result, that both practitioners and judges would have become sufficiently familiar with the principles of equity to administer it in a satisfactory manner in all the courts. Well, judges, therefore, would not be appointed to permanent divisions. Any appointment was subject to potential structural reorganization. As the Judicature Commissioners had previously put it, the new High Court should be divided into as many chambers or divisions as the nature and extent or the convenient dispatch of business might require. Intentions are fine things. The reality was somewhat different. Regular reorganization did not take place. The three common law divisions merged into the single Queen's Bench Division. That was facilitated by the deaths in 1880 of both Sir Alexander Coburn and Sir Fitzroy Kelly, the Chief Baron of the Exchequer. That left Lord Coleridge, the earlier ennobled Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, to become the second Lord Chief Justice of England, an office he held until 1894. All three had previously been Attorney General. 
That remains the only time the statutory power within the Judicature Act to reorganize the divisions has been exercised. The divisions have been subject to one further statutory reform when in 1970 the family division was created out of the probate, divorce and admiralty division. Probate was divided between the chancery and family divisions and lost its name as a divisional title. Admiralty became a court again rather than a division. It was transferred to the Queen's Bench Division and became a specialist court within it. The reform was not carried out under the mechanism provided in what by then was the power to restructure the divisions in the Supreme Court Act 1925. It was wrought by statutory reform in the Administration of Justice Act 1970. The amalgamation of the three common law divisions into the Queen's Bench Division in 1880 was an early gain which had had to await the retirement or death of the transitional Chief Justices. Whatever Sir George Jessel and other reformers may have intended in the 1870s, the Chancery Division, and equally since 1880 the Queen's Bench Division, have proved to be anything but temporary. The longevity of the divisions might have appeared unlikely following the late 19th century reforms, and particularly the amalgamation of the three common law divisions in 1880. With hindsight, it's clear to see why such a view was not justified by that merger. It had been apparent for decades, indeed almost two centuries before the 1870s reforms, that the three common law courts were essentially administering the same law. Their continued existence did not rest on any fundamental difference in the law they applied, as it did with the divide between the common law and equity courts. There really was no credible argument for maintaining three courts or divisions exercising a very similar jurisdiction. The reality was that the distri distribution of work tended to mean that much if not all of the work that called for the use of the old equitable jurisdiction was assigned to the Chancery Division, and there it has remained. As I've said, the underlying philosophy of the reforms was that the divisions could be created and reformed to reflect changes and developments in the needs of litigation. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was no <coughs> fixed view that there should be three divisions into which all should be short shoeboard. An opportunity arose in the 1890s to make radical change. There was then a justified concern that the High Court could not provide specialist, speedy, <coughs> and cost effective adjudication in commercial cases. Indeed, the business community had earlier been vocal throughout the first 70 years of the 19th century in support of court reform. That concern came to a head due to problems in the way Mr. Justice Lawrence dealt with the case of Rose and Bank of Australasia. Uh, his judgment took a very long time to emerge. And when it did, it failed to deal with a number of the claims that were in issue and had been argued before him. There was rumbling discontent and not assuaged when his overall conclusions were vindicated on appeal in the House of Lords. The point was that the English courts were not meeting the needs of the business community in the same way that they did magnificently in the 18th century, when the common law rose to the challenge of keeping pace with mercantilism. The criticism went to the quality of the judgments and also to the nature of the procedures in the Queen's Bench Division. This might have provided a peg on which to make divisional reform and create a commercial division of the High Court. If, as was said in the 1870s, the divisions were to be subject to regular reorganization, depending on changes in business before the courts, what better example than this uh, could have arisen? Surely a commercial division would be created. 
But as we know, that did not happen. A different route was taken, which kept the divisions intact. The judiciary has power to reorganize the internal business of the divisions. So rather than create a new division, in 1895, my predecessors created by order a new court, the commercial court within the Queen's Bench Division. It would formally become a specialist court of that division much later in 1970. That decision in 1895 might be seen as the moment when the divisions which emerged in 1880 really became cemented. The judiciary had identified a mechanism by which reform could take place without having to go through a statutory procedure to alter the divisions. The creation of new lists and where necessary new courts within the existing structure was easier to achieve than divisional reform. It did not require any prescribed procedure to achieve and its use has been flexible and prodigious. Since the 1890s, we've seen the expansion of specialist lists. Most recently, to meet modern business needs, we have created a specialist financial list. The first example of a joint list of both the commercial court in the Queen's Bench Division and the Chancery Division. After almost 130 years, it was the first formal admixture, not merger, of the jurisdiction of the old common law and equity courts of the High Court through their successor divisions. We have also just created a new media and communications list which draws on judges from both the Queen's Bench and Chancery Divisions. The intention underpinning its creation is the need to meet developments in defamation, privacy and data protection. There are also insolvency and companies lists. The Administrative Court sits within the Queen's Bench Division as the successor to the Crown Office list. <coughs> So too, the Planning Court and the Technology and Construction Court. Within the Chancery Division sit the Patents Court and the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court. Against this backdrop of flexibility, it is perhaps unsurprising that proposals to reform the divisions following the 2005 Constitutional Reform Act to create what was at one time referred to as X Division to deal with property and business disputes was not pursued. And that was despite over 10 years of detailed consideration. Equally, divisional reform was considered by Lord Justice Briggs as part of the Civil Court's structure review in 2015. He noted that the ability to create new lists when taken together with the recent co-location of the Commercial Court, Technology and Construction Court and Chancery Division in the Rolls Building in London, was able to secure effective reforms as business needs developed without changing the divisions. He described the present divisional structure as illogical, but concluded that it presented no real difficulties. It was thus quotes, probably best left alone, close quotes. Subsequently, building on the success of the financial list, a further set of cross-divisional reforms was initiated in July 2017, when the new business and property courts <coughs> were launched. The loose organisational structure covers the Queen's Bench Division's Commercial Court and its Technology and Construction Court, and the Chancery Division's specialist business, intellectual property, financial services, and insolvency work. Cross-divisional working and cross-divisional sittings are now the norm. On one level, the most recent administrative changes that created the business and property courts have echoed the 1870s reforms. In the 1870s, a new unified superstructure was created which retained within it 
the organization of its predecessor courts. In the 2010s, that unified superstructure, the High Court, complete with its retained echo of the Common Law and Chancery Courts, in practice is operating where necessary in a unified way. There remains much work in both divisions, which is exclusive to each, and derives from the long historical context of their creation. The divisions may not have proved to be a temporary measure, perhaps reflecting a greater sense of continuity than was anticipated by the 1870s reforms. But the aim of promoting a single jurisdiction divided as necessary to meet changing trends in litigation has been achieved. We remain willing and able to adapt to changing times without losing much that is valuable, both in the long-standing recognition of the high reputation of our specialist courts and the advantages of judges dealing with a wide range of work. This may not have been achieved as was originally intended by the Judicature Commission or the promoters of the 1870s legislation. Instead, there has been flexibility and imagination in using the possibilities of the single High Court created in 1873. Unlike the existence of the common law, equity and civilian courts, the superstructure is not a barrier to reform, dictated by changing times and the developing needs of all those who use our courts. I wouldn't go so far as Lord Briggs is suggesting that the, the divisions of the High Court are illogical. True, were we starting with a blank sheet of paper, things would look very different. That said, when one considers what came before the 1870s and the need to achieve reform through legislative change in an environment of deep legal conservatism and the guarding of vested interests, those reforms were a remarkable achievement. Their logic was driven by the art of the possible and the need to balance competing interests. Making fundamental structural changes to the divisions today now would have many practical adverse consequences. That's a topic perhaps for another day. Yet the power within the judiciary to make adaptations when necessary to reflect changes in the needs of litigators has served us well and will continue to do so. There is much else on our plates, not least the urgent work to make good the lack of investment in our courts over decades, made possible in part by the modernization program supported with government funding. The judiciary is contributing its expertise to help shape, shape the many projects with a view to improving access to justice and the effectiveness of all our systems and processes. There is no clamor for structural reform for three divisions. Most can live with some anomalies. But strange as it may seem, the temporary arrangements put in place in 1873 has not served us too badly and may yet serve us for some time to come. Thank you.
So our first year students, and when we've taught them, we've sort of showed them the little diagram of the High Court and all the various divisions in it and all the individuals and how many judges. Uh, it's quite complicated and we make them learn that for a test, which I think the first year is probably um, sat a, a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully now they understand why that diagram looks as complicated um, as it does and the origins behind it. Um, so, also, um, the Student Law Society have organised, I think you may know, a competition for the audience of students, I mean, association with the Plymouth Law Society have very kindly um, donated a prize for students to reflect on um, Sir Ian's talk uh, and think about what, what he said and I know that colleagues will be looking forward to receiving um, your reflections um, and essays and the best one uh, when the panel have sort of looked at that will be published um, in the Plymouth Law Review hopefully as well um, with your talk to um, Sir Ian so we thank you uh, very much for, for that as well. Um, the remit of the court is clearly immense, it's dynamic, um, and I think sometimes perhaps it gets overlooked just um, how much, not just you being guardians of the judges, but the High Court being very much guardians um, of the rule of law. Um, so very much appreciate that. So could we please now give our thanks again to Sir Ian for...